Okay, I just want to tell you a couple of quick stories about uh, Pork Fest. Um, does anybody know where the Red Cabin is over there? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, the first Pork Fest was a bunch of guys predominantly around the campfire at the Red Cabin. And, you know, we didn't even spill out beyond that. So this is how far we've come. There's a little history about Pork Fest in the uh, program. Um, it went from there. We were still, like, a minority of the sites here. So this is all very encouraging progress. Um, so tonight... We're welcoming a uh, panel here to the Alt Expo Lounge uh, to talk about some of the um, the excitements of Fort Fest and some of the things that we all care about and we're concerned about. And uh, the Alt Expo, for example, started in 2007 just to try to augment what Fort Fest and Liberty Forum are, bring some new topics to it. So tonight we're going to bring your panel here, and we have Larkin Rose, Carla Garricky. Teresa Earl, Baron Swearingen, Josie Wales, I don't know your real name, so that's good, huh? <laughs> and I'm going to turn you over to Teresa, who's going to modify the, modify, moderate the panel tonight. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm moderating, but I don't have much of a voice, so I'm going to not talk too much. Yay. Um, so there was a video that came out a while ago, and it was talking about um, feelings of talk, the need to have a conversation about the non-aggression po policy, the use of force, and like how do you have that, co and there was a lot of drama around that video. So we decided to invite Josie and Larkin um, to come and speak with us, and Baron and Carl. So to give you a little bit of information, Josie is a new mover. She just moved to New Hampshire last week, so let's Woo! give you a She has a YouTube show that I think you'd all probably really like. Um, it's called Josie the Outlaw. And she has some really awesome um, ideas to share. So, and then you have Varen. Varen is a board member of the FSP, but he's going to be talking tonight about his own perspective and talking a little bit about what the board perspective might be on the FSP and he'll try and differentiate between those things so you kind of get an understanding of where he's coming from when he's talking about things as an individual and also in his role as a board member. If you don't know who Carla is, y'all should just leave now. <laughs> she is our fearless porcupine queen. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. And Larkin Rose, again, if you don't know who he is, I don't know what you're doing here. <laughs> so, we are going to start the conversation and give everybody a chance to talk for a couple minutes about what their thoughts are. And then we have one microphone, so uh, we'll pass it around and see what happens, all right? Thanks for showing up. Where's the fire? <laughs> yeah, I got a lighter. <laughs> okay, I guess um, it's important to, I guess, understand how this started, why we made the video to begin with. It was um, uh, my idea. Um, I had originally, um, I had been asked to come to Pork Fest in years past and couldn't come um, just because of work or whatever. Um, and, and I had learned a little bit more about the FSP. Um, I knew what it was um, and, you know, what the, what the purpose of it was. Um, but as I started to know more people in the Liberty Movement, I was more and more curious about it. Um, and so I started asking more questions online about what, like, what is, it has a board. That was strange to me that the Free State Project had a president. So I asked more questions about that. And, and I got some answers there, and I liked it. Uh, and I like, you know, I appreciate the answers I got. Um, I met Carla at Liberty Fest in NYC. We were both speaking at an event. Um, and, you know, after that, she sent me an email telling how, asking if I was coming to Pork Fest. And I said yes. Um, I speak really quickly, I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, so um, she explained it was a, you know, that I could submit a form to, to speak. Um, so I asked, and I had heard, you know, rumor, at that point it was just rumors, and I started looking a little bit into it, but I asked, um, you know, that basically what I heard was that the discussion of use of force was being censored. So my question was, what if that was my topic? Would I be, you know, is that okay or is it being censored? And the answer I received was that it wasn't being censored. Um, but that I, it was uh, suggested that I choose another topic uh, because um, all Expo and not Pork, Pork Fest wasn't having this discussion. Um, at first I said, okay, I have some other things I could talk about, and then I started thinking about it more, and I thought, no, what if I really wanted to talk about that? And she said, well, like I said, I guess I think it was, yeah, like I said, all Expo is doing that, so I'll refer you to Teresa. So um, I didn't receive the email. Teresa absolutely did respond to me. I didn't respond. I didn't get that, and I apologize for saying that in the video. That's my fault. Um, 
later I did see it. Um, but uh, so that's great. Old all, all Expo is having that. Um, but basically, what I was concerned about was that because um, Porkfest was ran, is ran by the the FSP, um, and I was a little concerned, like like I stated in the video, that the use of force, uh, basically the principle that we all abide by as you know libertarians, voluntarists, anarchists, is the non-aggression principle. And I think in order for us to be able to explain that to other people and really open people's minds, we have to identify what, like what Teresa said to me, and what I totally agree with, and it's the reason we made the video, identify what, what aggression is, um, so that we can um, identify when it's time to fight back. Because the non-aggression principle, as we all know, is that we will hurt no one, we, we will aggress upon no one, but if someone's, you know, threatening our lives, then we will fight back. So that was the point of me making the video. Um, I didn't, I was a little nervous, of, I was a little apprehensive about coming to an event that, in my opinion, was being censored if that discussion was not being held at all by the board um, who was running the event. So, that was me. That was why I did it. Quick show of hands. Who's first pork fest? Wow. Hey, yeah. Now, I'm going to do this again later in the week, and I hope that the result is better. But for those of you, whether this is your first pork fest or not, so far at this pork fest, has your mind been changed with respect to moving to New Hampshire? If it has, I just am curious. There's a, there's a maybe a couple. We got a couple. That's exciting. That's why we do this, by the way, is to bring people here and and we hope show off a little bit of New Hampshire and the Free State Project with the goal of getting people who care about freedom to move to New Hampshire. For those of you who don't know me, and if this is a lot of your first pork fest, that's probably a lot of you. Uh, my name is Baron Swearingen. Um, I'm on the board of the Free State Project. There is a board. There is actually a corporation. Um, many of you probably maybe don't know that, but uh, from the very beginning there has been a corporation, and the board is the entity that um, handles the corporate junk that nobody actually really likes. Um, there's, a, there's a strategic purpose for the board, and there's a legal purpose for the board. Um, and I, I don't think we want to dive too far into those details because we want to talk about the topic, which is discussion about the use of force. Um, anyhow, so I've been involved with the Free State Project for a long time. Um, I'm a non-new mover. I moved almost 10 years ago from California. And uh, this is my 11th pork fest out of 11. That's all of them. Um, and uh, I was twice also the president of the Free State Project uh, before Carla, two non-consecutive occasions, um, and at the moment, uh, I'm the longest serving board member. So I have a bit of knowledge of the history of the organization, and I'm happy to share all of that. Um, for now, I think I'd like to wait, if that's, if that's okay, maybe we can finish introductions. I'd like to wait a little bit to dive too far into the content, um, but what I'll try to do as I respond, hopefully we'll have some dialogue, Q&A and all of that, as I respond, will be um, both to share my opinions, but also my knowledge of the history of the FSP and what I think is kind of the current consensus of the board and, and why those, those positions are the way they are. And hopefully that'll be um, educational and informative for all of you. Hi. Um, so it occurs to me I have no idea why I'm here <laughs> as part of this conversation. But um, so I am going to see my role in two ways. One is I'm going to trash talk. That's what I'm going to do tonight. <laughs> Baron's here. He can speak smart. Um, I actually will d disclaim that I'm pretty sure anything that comes out of my mouth um, is not probably the view of the FSP board. <laughs> and so I will be speaking as an individual tonight. Um, I want to make two sort of opening salvos, I guess. First of all is that um, I think, you know, let's, when we get into the discussion, talk talk a little bit about what is censorship, is that a status concept, do different rules apply if it's a private organization, um, you know, I'm sorry if you didn't understand what the structure was before, you know, someone got involved, but the reality is there are people who have been keeping the lights on so that we can do what we're doing here and we can attract the people we are attracting here and we can build the community that we're building here. And so, you know, it's it's great when people come in and they're excited and I genuinely believe like part of your passion for this comes out of the excitement and the passion of it. But, you know, don't call it censorship and we'll get into that. 
And, um, you know, I hope that this is a, a good, useful dialogue, and I think it will be. I don't exactly have a reputation for modifying my words to make normal people approve of what I say. <laughs> and I think they're normal people like approval, they like to get along, and that's actually a good tendency, unless there are things horribly wrong with the world. If there are things horribly wrong with the world, it's the people who don't care if they're hated who stand up and say, things are horribly wrong with the world. And to me, what was particularly creepy about this issue sort of being pushed to the side is that it's the only issue that matters, if you ask me, because Slaves can sit around saying, wouldn't it be cool if we were free? Yeah. Well, maybe we should try to escape. Shut up. That is not an approved topic because some people are scared of that and bad things might happen. To say we don't like aggression committed against us as libertarians and anarchists and volunteers say, what we do? Who does? But to be able to talk about what we do when it happens, what we have the right to do, even if it's just theoretical, even if you're not doing anything yet, even if, like in most of my videos that talk about it, I say, on a practical level, if you resist the cops, they kill you, so you probably shouldn't very often. Um, but if that discussion is left out, it is not a discussion about freedom. It is a discussion about slaves saying bad things about their masters and doing nothing to actually accomplish freedom. Um, and that's why I found it rather disturbing that it, that the topic was kind of pushed aside. And Carla wants to respond. No, I was looking for a notepad because I don't remember from moment to moment. I don't think it's a legitimate concern to say it was pushed aside. Larkin, you have spoken here many times over the years. Every year we have different organizers because people do it once and they're like, this is too hard. Like, we are not, like, it's not like putting together a festival for, you know, 2,000 normals. It's putting together a festival for a bunch of cats, right? And, you know, we'll, we'll jokingly say, you know, my real job is I'm the cat herder. And so there was no slight intended. There was nothing other than the organizers of the event said that the topic this year is do it yourself. They get to choose, they get to line up the people. I really work very, very hard to have a laissez-faire approach to organizing cats. And it's not easy. So I think let's dispel with that part where it's not an issue of censorship, it was an issue of organization. We also every year try to do new things. We're growing. We want the people who have come before to come again because they will get something out of it as well. So you kind of want to keep things fresh. And I think with the do-it-yourself approach, the idea was everyone here has something valuable to contribute. Everyone here is a person with a voice and an opinion. And if we can get people to start to get on the soapbox, this is how we grow the movement, right? And some people on the soapbox want to talk about things like the nap and talk about use of force and you know it's a sexy topic if I was just doing one thing that would be my topic because you know what you can fill a room it's easy right but we have to or from my perspective I'm trying to build a large community with many different people who are interested in many things and I think to reduce it to you're a slave if you don't want to shoot people is symptomatic <laughs> <laughs> okay, so who wants to respond to that? Because I ain't got my dad. <laughs> this is not my fault. Go that way. Yeah. <laughs> now, if we keep doing this, Carl and I get twice as much time to talk, which <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't know if that's good or not. You'll need it. Let me. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me back up a little bit and share some history. The um, first thing I think that's good to cover, and, and this room, everybody should know kind of the answer to this, and that is, the, the question is, what is the Free State Project? So the Free State Project is an agreement, ultimately would be among 20,000 people, to move to the state of New Hampshire and exert the fullest practical effort towards 
the creation of a society in which the maximum role of government is the protection of individuals' rights to life, liberty, and property. That's a um, no bigger than, let's say, minarchist uh, statement and certainly admits um, uh, voluntarist, anarchist, etc., etc. That maximum word uh, just puts a lid on it right there. So uh, the people who are welcome are the people who can sign that statement of intent. They say, well, I want a society that's got a government no bigger than that, maybe smaller, that's okay. Um, but we have also, from the very, very beginning, this is not a new thing, we've also said there are certain people who are not welcome. Now, I'd like to point out that this is not a censorship issue. That is to say, the Free State Project has no power to censor um, in, the real, in the real use of the word censorship. In other words, we can't tell uh, Larkin or Josie or anybody else, you can't say that. Uh, we can't tell Chris Cantwell, bless his heart, you can't say that. Um, but what the Free State Project can do is say, these types of people are not welcome. And, and what the statement is, is we don't welcome people who promote violence, racial hatred, or bigotry. And that one little line there was, um, was inserted, was added very, very early on to avoid attracting certain types of people. That is, those who would provo promote violence, racial hatred, or bigotry. And for better or worse, the freedom movement has attracted those kinds of people, certain parts of the freedom movement. The Free State Project has attracted some of those kinds of people. And very early on, the organizers thought, you know what? That's really not what we're all about. This is not supposed to be a white supremacist group. It's not supposed to be a little, you know, um, insular, our people are okay, yours are not. It's not supposed to be a let's go violently overthrow the government kind of a group. That's not what the Free State Project is about. And so we don't welcome people who do those things. And over the course of the history of the project, we have unwelcomed people from time to time, not just within the last year, but from the very beginning. And I've been involved personally in that process on a number of occasions. And I, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but if we said a couple handfuls, we'd be in the ballpark. Um, they've not all been violence. Some have. Um, the recent one that everybody's aware of, the Chris Cantwell uh, unwelcoming, was uh, due to promotion of violence. And so, and I'll come back to I'll come back to that a little later, because I know you want to talk about that, and, and let's dive into that, but just to give a little more perspective, um, we have also unwelcome people for promoting racial hatred. That issue has come up on a couple of occasions, and we don't want that. We don't think that is ultimately productive towards the goal. The goal is a society in which the maximum role of government is the protection of life, liberty, and individuals, rights to life, liberty, and property. So the, the board early on, before my time, uh, decided that those people were really not likely to be productive to that end, and therefore they weren't welcome. That's a decision that is made on the part of the Free State Project. That's a private organization. That is to say it's not um, the law of the land. It's not a government thing. It's a voluntary association. If you don't like that, you're welcome to not sign the statement of intent and not move to New Hampshire. But that's what the Free State Project is. So. Um, I think this discussion comes up specifically because of the not welcoming people who promote violence. Now with that background, I'll maybe turn this into a question, and the question is, are we talking about defense, that is the use of force not to initiate force or aggress or, or be violent or initiate violence, um, but, but to to defend yourself, to stop the imminent aggression? Or are we talking about a general promotion of, of a policy of violence? Like our method, our means of action is going to be let's go kill the fill in the blank or whatever it happens to be. So that's the question. What kind of discussion are we having? Are we promoting that or, or not? Well, I, I can speak for myself when I say it's defense, absolutely. Um, and I, um, to what Carla said, you know, just because you won't shoot someone doesn't make you, you know, a slave. Now, I don't think he was being specifically saying that, but um, in my opinion, if, <laughs> if I'm a slave and I don't resist by any means necessary to get my life back, because if I don't have the choice to do what I want when I want with my life, I don't have my life and I'm dead inside. And I'm just, I'm not, I'm not my own person. If I don't defend to the best of my ability, including force, 
violent force, if I try to leave a plantation that I'm being held as a slave, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm being chased, and I turn around and I fight back, and I have a gun, and I shoot at people who are shooting at me, if I don't do whatever it takes to get out of being a slave, yes, I'm a slave. I will always be a slave because I'm not fighting back. Um, I would never aggress upon someone who was not hurting me, ever. It's, it's, that's unspeakable to me, and it's not acceptable. So, of course, this is a discussion about use of defensive force, not aggressive force. Um, and I think once you, your choice is being taken away from you, there are absolutely certain um, levels that you can go through. You know, first you try, and I talk about this all the time, first you try to appeal to someone's, you know, level of reasoning and their conscience. Um, and then you kind of go forth. If that doesn't work, then you kind of just, it depends on how far you want to take it. You know, it can go from something as simple as being pulled over and you decide, I wouldn't do it, but if you want to decide to make that your last stance, and you decide not to pull over to the side of the road because you know you weren't doing anything wrong and you weren't harming anyone, well, you're going to be chased by the police. And if you decide not to pull over to the side of the road, you just keep going. You're not picking up speed. You just kind of go along on your way. You're going to be surrounded by police cars because you're not slowing down. Now, um, you're likely to be killed in the event that you decide to never back down. Tactically, that's not a smart move. Um, but morally, you're well within your right if you have guns pulled on you to turn around and be the one to shoot first. Um, in my opinion, but that's it. Larkin next. Let's, yeah, let's oh, yeah. Yeah, I do it just a circle. It's hard to get into that. Like, that's better, right? Mm -hmm. the, it's nice this discussion is happening because, to me, the, the two points that actually mattered, I've found almost no discussion about it until right now. Um, the line of, we don't, we don't want people promoting violence is just a giant instant question mark to me, which is, what does that mean? Because in the general sense, violence just means use of physical force against human being. Um, I'm going to offend some people. If somebody all the way doesn't promote violence in any situation, meaning force, physical force against human being, he's a coward. If there's a little kid next to you and somebody's come to take that kid and said, yeah, I'm not their parent, I'm going to torture them and kill them, and you say, I'm not stooping to your level. By resorting to violence, you're a freaking coward. And I know nobody here would do that, which means everybody here promotes violence. So the question is, all right, when is it defensive and when is it not? That is a very important discussion. It isn't happening at Fest because it's not allowed to. And it's happening right now. How is it it, not it's happening right to? now at Alt Expo. Good point. And here's the problem. The, and, and I heard you mention the imminent thing, and I heard Jody Underwood mention that in an interview she did with George Donnelly, um, and that was, like, I, I was trying to find some sort of position statement by the board saying, well, what do they mean by promoting violence? And, and then I, I did a video about the, the imminent threat thing, which I think is both irrational and immoral. To limit the use of force to when there is an immediate threat right there. Now, I think we all agree that if somebody's running at you with an axe, you have the right to defend yourself. So you're Israel? No, don't <laughs> don't make <laughs> crap up, please. Oh, <laughs> Let him finish. There is a line between you can only defend yourself when he's swinging an axe at you and randomly killing people because they might do something. The in between is. If, and I use this example, and I've had debates with people recently, and they usually flounder around. If you've seen somebody, let's say you, you, you subscribe to this imminent threat thing. We only think force is justified if there's an imminent threat to your safety. So some guy shows up in the middle of town, whacks a hatchet into somebody's head, who falls over dead. And he goes, hey, I'm not a threat now. You didn't stop me when I was swinging, haha, because you didn't know I was going to. Now he's down on the ground, and he has my hatchet in his head. I am not a threat. You cannot touch me based on the imminent threat standard. And when I come back with a new hatchet tomorrow and do the same damn thing tomorrow, you can't do anything if you abide by the imminent threat standard because according to you, it's initiating violence to tackle me when I'm not threatening anybody. He's already on the ground dead, not threatening anybody now. That is why I believe it is completely irrational and immoral to abide by the imminent threat standard. The trouble is, it's tough to draw a line of, well, what do you do? If you have a serial killer, most people would agree, we have the right to go to his house and kick down his door. I mean, everybody saw it. This isn't, this isn't the case where we're not sure who did it or this, you know. 
because I'm I'm not at all for using force against somebody based on a rumor or an accusation or whatever. But in the case where everybody saw it, everybody knows to just kill people over and over and again. Yes, I would personally have the right to go to his house, kick down his door, point a gun in his face, and take him hostage. Now, how about if you got a badge? Do we dare to talk about the exact same scenario if the guy had a badge? If we can't have that discussion, we cannot discuss what has been the source of 99% of the murder in the world, which is serial murder committed by agents of the state, and what do you do about it? Okay, I have no idea where to go with this, so I'm going to go back to trash talking. <laughs> okay, I'm totally for you trash talking, but does anybody actually have a response to that? I, well, I have a couple of... Go, okay. Go ahead, yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, I think um, to Josie's point where she, you, you sort of talked about feelings, right? You said, well, if they're hurting me which is, I think, a very, um, and I don't mean this as a diss, uh, it's a very female way of looking at basically what you were saying too, right? So one of the challenges is you, you, know, you want to go to the Free State Project website and find a policy position on this. But the point of what we are doing is part of what we are doing with the Free State Project and building this community is we have no fucking idea what we're doing, right? I mean that in a really genuine sense. I'm a volunteerist anarchist, right? And it's like, okay, how do you actually come up with, because we're all cool with no rulers, but like we want some rules, right? Because we want to live in a milieu in a society or in a community at a minimum where it's like okay this is cool and this shit's not cool and it's not that easy to say what is what is cool and what is not cool and right like discussions are yes fun. and that's why we are having this discussion not a pork fan. it <laughs> Yeah, and actually, that that would be really useful to know who here actually paid for Pork Fest. All right, let me do it the other way around. Who's got balls? Who didn't pay for Pork Fest? Not camping here. Not using facilities. All right. So when someone sees Larkin pee in the woods, <laughs> be nice. <laughs> Don't shoot him. <laughs> um, all right, so that's probably enough trash talk. But really what I'm trying to say is this is equally a challenge for all of us. Like this is a legitimate discussion to have because I know personally I am not keen to, you know, write more and more policies and Larkin made the point that, well, this is sort of vague and that's part of the point, right? Either we become an organization that sort of has to drill down and there's, you know, section 5, A, 1, C, little ro Roman numeral and, like, we don't want to live that way. So we felt like that was a pretty broad-based thing that can be the yay or nay. But ultimately, we are building a community. Like, we want people to be around us. And I say this, again, personally, but, I, you know, this is my Malcolm Re Reynolds moment, is it's like, either you're on the spaceship and we're kind of all pulling, you know, into outer space together, or it's like, go get your own fucking spaceship. <laughs> Is an airplane acceptable? <laughs> I'm an airline pilot, for those of you who don't know. Um, so there's the discussion, and then there's um, advocacy or promotion, and then there's action. So there's some, um, let's, let's just say for now, three kind of levels of things that we can address before we even get to content. And the content here is the use of force and what constitutes defense versus aggression, et cetera, et cetera. Well, let's back up a moment, and I'd like to make it clear that we don't object to discussion. And that is in writing. That is to say it, the, the list of what's not welcome is not discussing violence or, or racial hatred or bigotry. We do discuss those things. 
Um, what is not welcome is promotion of violence or racial hatred or bigotry. Now, with, without even discussing the content itself, um, I'd like to make it clear that discussion that's, that stops short of promotion is welcome. And I think it should be welcome here at Porkfest. I think it should be welcome at Liberty Forum. These are important topics. I don't shy away from them. I don't know all the answers. Um, and uh, and I, I'm not sure I even want to know all the answers. <laughs> But uh, the board, I, I think the, the sense of the board is, is not too far from what Carla said. I don't think we want to get too deep into nitpicky definitions. And, and I think that may actually be a good idea for, the, for a lot of the reasons that Carla mentioned. Now, there's a, in the, in the so the, uh, what's not welcome? Promotion of violence, racial hatred, or bigotry. In the policy and procedure for how that's applied, the board does actually have a policy that requires the board voting on individual cases. So we don't just kind of like, oh, I don't like this person, let's kick him out. That's not the way it works. There is a policy, but there's... Because then, everyone... That's <laughs> right, yeah, this would, be a, this would be a small club. So the policy not only requires the board to vote, but it also gives the board another little out, and that is that if, if there's somebody like we, we didn't foresee maybe some behavior or idea or something or another that really is counterproductive to the mission of the Free State Project, not just somebody that we don't like, um, we don't make decisions on that basis, but if, if there's somebody that's behaving in a way or advocating in a way that we think is really genuinely harmful to the project itself, we can, by voting, again, unwelcome or remove them. Now, what all that means is we take you off the list of participants so that number clicks backwards by one and we may go so far as to send an email or a phone call or something and say look you're not the kind of person that we're looking for once again this has happened maybe a dozen times in the last dozen years so it's a very small number of people um, so that is promotion or it has on occasion been action. We've looked at uh, the actions of a person when we couldn't dialogue with them for some reason or another like they're in jail um, and said, we believe this is promoting violence. They've uh, gone far enough to actually land themselves in jail for activity that was clearly not defensive. They were initiating violence against somebody else, and we've removed them from the, from the participant list on that basis. When it comes to discussion, I think controversial discussion, meaningful discussion, discussion about important topics, and I think the, the topic you raise, and, and frankly the topic that Chris Cantwell raises, um, and, and I hate just raising his name over and over again, I guess he's here in spirit, right? Um, is an important topic, but what, and, and again, this is the sense of the board, the board voted, so, so what I'm saying is relaying what's already happened. The sense of the board was he advocated, he promoted very, you know, repeatedly, clearly crossed that line to promoting violence. That is to say, that's, it, it looked to the, seven of us, and I, th I think it was a unanimous vote if I recall correctly, it looked at the seven of us like he crossed that line. What it looks like to us is he's saying, oh, you know, um, you're a police officer, so obviously you're guilty, and bang. Now, I'd like to also point out that the Free State Project does not welcome people who promote bigotry, and like it or not, the notion that anybody associated with the government is is therefore an aggressor is actually a kind of bigoted notion that may not actually be true. Now, we could discuss this. <laughs> that's a different if, night. That's a different night. That's a different night, and I'm happy to have that discussion. Um, in fact, it's interesting to me to hear that level of disagreement. The, the question of closeness of association is worth discussing, and depending on how you draw that line, that might implicate every person in this room, whether you like it or not. So, um, case in point, probably a lot of you drove here, you drove in a car that was, I don't know, I mean, we could make a lot of arguments. It, it would get ridiculous, and I don't think we really need to do that right now. All right? My roads! My roads! All right. Can I hear it from my roads? Where's my car? Yeah, my car flies. So anyways, <laughs> so anyways, the point being, discussion is not off limits. It's not off limits here at Porkfest or at Liberty Forum, um, and I think that it's valuable to discuss this. <coughs> Promoting violence is not the kind of thing that we want to welcome, and we do that as a organization for strategic reasons, 
Um, and, and the board exists additionally for legal reasons to have a, um, a way to you know, handle money and keep the organization going on an ongoing basis. There's a lot of you know, stuff that none of us actually really like. Um, anyway, so that's probably enough. Discussion, good. Okay, I'm not really sure exactly where to go from there, but I guess we'll start by, I guess we should really get into some situations where um, force would be morally justified. I know people don't really like the word, um, you know, the whole morality thing because a lot of people think it's subjective. Um, uh, I believe that if I'm not hurting another person physically, um, that I am, <laughs> I'm being moral. <laughs> if I am, I'm, you know, I agree to let others live free as long as they'll let me live free. Um, now, I guess um, a big hot topic would be uh, <coughs> politicians. When is it okay to use violence against a politician? Let's take one politician um, in particular who has maybe signed order after executive order to kill innocent men and women all over the world um, via drone bombings. Now, he's probably doing this. His name's Barack Obama, in case anyone doesn't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> he is doing this right now as we speak. I think anyone in this room on this planet would be morally justified to walk in his Oval Office and murder him. Tactically, it's not smart, because all you're going to do is they're going to, you're going to lose your life, they're going to appoint another president, and the state is still going to continue on running as it is. Um, now, that's the thing, is, is when... But the thing is, it's more, sorry, I lost track. It's morally justified to do that. Now, when it comes to politicians, it's pretty much morally justified to do that to almost every single politician as well. No. Um, no. Almost every single politician is participating in the oppression. No. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, <laughs> whether they know it or not. Now, tactically, I'm saying it's not intelligent to do that because you have an opportunity to appeal to their logic, reason, and morality and try to explain to them why we don't need the state to extort money from people, to cage, assault, um, beat the shit out of people just so they'll do what the state wants them to do. That's the first tactic that we should take. That's the tactic I take. I don't go around punching politicians in the face because I don't agree with them. I used to vote for them. I don't, I look back and I, you know, every mistake I made led me to where I am now and it, I regret, you know, being a part of the system and believing it. However, I no longer do and I believe that the majority of the world can get to that point as well if we only do our jobs to help open their eyes. Um, so I know I'm veering off track on this, but basically what I'm saying is that it's, you're morally justified in basically <laughs> violently attacking anyone who's violently attacking anyone else, which a lot of police officers, men, women in uniform, and you know, men and women on Capitol Hill are doing daily. Controversial troublemaker. <laughs> the whole chain of command thing is a huge issue, and to me it's, a, it's an important litmus test, because to me, the first thing I look for is if somebody has a double standard based on their belief in authority. If you heard that some guy hired a hitman to kill his spouse just because he was kind of tired with, of her, would you think it horrible for somebody to go forcibly capture him, maybe even kill him? <laughs> Pretty bad. Is it only okay to go after the hitman, or is it okay to go after the guy who hired the hitman to commit murder? Now, if you say that's okay, and you don't say that's okay for a politician, or you grumble when Josie talks about it, Maybe it's because inside your head you still have the most dangerous superstition lodged in there and you still think that when you legislate evil, it becomes a little bit more good. And when we look outside of where we are now in other contexts, like if we, if we ask, like, what about all the attempts by Germans to kill Hitler? Do we now applaud that, the, the movie Valkyrie? which is based on a true story. Man, Hitler was one lucky bastard. All the attempts on him by his underlings to knock him off because they recognized he was evil and he was destroying their own country, the fact that they all failed was freaking amazing. We cheer for them. That is the equivalent of someone in the U.S. military trying to knock off Barack Obama because they see him as a murderer ruining this country. Now, do we measure it the same way 
or is our belief in authoritarianism mangling our view of reality? And if, if you take out the supposed authority and your opinion changes, that means you aren't seeing reality as it is. If adding a badge suddenly changes right and wrong to you, the problem is still inside your head. So, yeah, on a practical level, knocking off politicians doesn't do any good. They're going to put up new ones, and they're going to do the same thing or worse. But if you can't talk about the concept and the principle of, well, what about the guy at the top who told the underling to tell the underling to tell the underling to go commit murder? Is he just off the hook because he's sitting in his you know, limo somewhere, and, well, he didn't do it, so he's, he's not guilty? We don't use that standard with normal people in normal everyday life. Well, I just hired the hitman. You can't do anything to me. You know, I didn't pull the trigger, so I'm fine. And I'm, I'm representing you by hiring the hitman to kill my spouse, because she's kind of annoying. So. We don't accept that in any other context. If we accept it in the context of government, it's because the myth of authority is still warping our perceptions. So again, the practical is always separate from the moral. Um, oh, uh, quick one to say, I don't want to hog the mic for hours. Um, when you talked about promoting, it's really hard to, in principle, say, this is right, but I'm not saying do it. There's, you know, to say, hey, you, go shoot that cop. You know, that's direct, imminent instruction to go do a particular act. But promoting defensive force and saying defensive force is justified, I don't know how the two are any different. Uh, for example, I would have suggested to lots of people in a certain country a few decades back, when they come to put you in the cattle cars, kill them. All right, let me change pace just for a second, because I, I, I genuinely like, respect everyone here's opinion, and I don't know if we're going to throw it up into the floor at some stage, too. But I'm going to put on, uh, and I, you know, I've done apple seed. I can snipe at 400 yards. So, like, I know what I'm talking about when I say I really actually struggle with the ideas of morality and the ideas of killing and where pacifism might fall on that scale. Because what I struggle with when I hear you speak is the idea that the most dangerous superstition, right, is there's the state. And it's this force that goes out and it says, we should kill these people because these are the things we believe in. And that's the state. And then you come and you say, in order for us to have to defend ourselves, it might be likely, or in some cases, people should go and suddenly you're, you know, in your cape and you're the superhero and you're the person deciding, oh, you know what? Yes, this person should get whacked because they did this. Oh, this person. You made a very simple example earlier where you said, oh, all of us in the room are gonna know who the bad guy is, right? But the thing is, that's not how the real world works. And so at some stage it becomes, how do you avoid becoming them? the principle of non-aggression. And there are reasons to use the concepts of, of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You don't kill someone based on a suspicion. Um, but there are lots of people committing murder in broad daylight on video and getting away with it, and they almost always wear badges. We know they did it, they don't pretend they aren't doing it, and they're getting away with it and knowing there are no consequences to committing murder if you wear a badge. Gonna, um, after Josie, we're going to turn it so that you all can start asking some questions as well. There, there are, there do appear to me to be clear cases like you mentioned where a police officer commits an act of violence, it's on video, and they get away with it. Um, to me, that's not particularly controversial. Um, you know, if they're a murderer, they're a murderer. And I'm, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to argue the... Um, against your point about the myth of the state. Um, and it, some people do have that problem. But to extend that to any participation in government, for example, uh, what you said, politicians, almost all the politicians, or, or by extension all the politicians, that never-ending expansion includes a lot of people who not only did not directly commit any kind of violence against anybody else, but also may 
may genuinely be unaware. So um, let's turn this around a little bit and, and challenge something I think that you said, which was we don't accept, that is, we don't accept this um, fiction of the state, and we don't accept that concept or that notion, that defense in any other um, environment. And I'm not sure that that's actually true. I'll give you, hang on one second here, I've got to undo my noisemaker here. Um, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure that's actually true, and I'll give you an example, and that is somebody who's mentally ill. Um, now, you're, the, the, several of the examples that you've made were, well, uh, kill them. you said kill them, like uh, they're coming to get you in the cattle cars, right? Um, so there's two issues here. The first issue is, is that actually the right response? Do we have to take somebody's life, or is there some other measure of defense that might make sense? And by the way, you were referring to something where there's an imminent danger. So. Um, I think that's I think that's instructive that your example um, there is the imminent danger, but um, there's also the matter. Of, so so the first first issue is: Do we want to defend with the maximum force possible, or do we want to defend with the minimum force that's effective at stopping the violence? And I think the my answer is the latter. Um, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of the whole board, but just to give a little bit of insight, the cleverly worded thing that we voted on about the nameless person uh, last year was what, he, what he's promoting ex exceeds the reasonable right to self-defense or I think that's kind of how the wording was so when we think about what what do we need to do to, to defend ourselves instead of looking at a maximum like okay you know you might do something or be in the process now of doing something harmful to me so I think the thing I should do is kill you um, look at is there some way to restrain you is there some other thing um, and then secondly, we've kind of omitted the due process and consideration of who the person is and what are the circumstances, what are all the circumstances. The facts may not actually be in controversy, and in, and in fact many times they're not in controversy, but we don't really know if that person's actually sane, and, and your comments about the myth of government um, really, really are, I would say, instructive or enlightening. Maybe these people are not what I would call sane or... Um, we say in our right minds. In other words, they buy that same myth. They're they're part of the myth. They perpetrate the myth, right? But it is kind kind of a form of illness if you think about it to say it's okay for me to do this because I have the badge or because I'm the politician or because I'm the Christian crusader or the Muslim jihadist or the, any other thing, right? I'm part of the mob. Uh, this is what the mafia does. You know, that's just the way it is. So it must be okay. It's not. It's not okay for any of them. None of them. So, I, I don't think we do justice in, number one, advocating the, kind of the maximum available, and number two, considering what, what are their actions and what is their state of mind? Are they actually fit to make the decision that they're making? Are they in their right mind? Probably not. Um, there may be other issues, but I'm going to leave it at that for now. I'll let you comment, and then maybe we can... Okay, now I, I definitely agree with that. The, um, the, you know, the level of association, that can expand and expand and expand. And when I said almost all politicians, I meant almost all politicians. <laughs> and when I said, I said almost for a reason. Um, on a local level, I, you know, I have some great friends who are politicians and who are trying to make an immediate difference to better life for the people who do still li live within police states and are making those differences. And that I applaud. Now, I know that, and that even, that's a conflict within myself because I consider myself a volunteerist. So I myself won't participate within the state. But I know that if I have a family and I live in that police state, my kids go to that school, but I want life to be better for me while I'm there and for my family, which is already there, absolutely. I don't advocate any, I don't think it's moral for someone to go and kill them, clearly. I felt the need to clear that up because I feel like that can, it can get all lumped together and the level of association can expand and expand and expand. Um, so I don't really have anything else to say, but I mean, I really, I genuinely appreciate all the hard work that goes in the pork fest. I know it's, it's, it can be an extreme, it is an extremely difficult job. I'm happy to finally be here. Um, I'm happy that we all got to sit and have this discussion. Um, and um, that's it. I guess we could turn it over to. Yeah. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand. Right. Might be easier if you kind of come over here and form a little bit of a line. Sorry. So where I live, uh, there was a uh, young homeless man that was beat to death by six cops, and his name is Kelly Thomas. 
And uh, two of those officers were fired and later indicted on uh, murder charges for which they were acquitted. Uh, those two cops are now trying to get their jobs back. And to me, that is uh, them trying to seek to get their license to kill again. Does that or does that not represent an imminent and credible threat? Imminent. Anyone? Woo. Trying not to hog it. <laughs> no, go ahead. We don't make sense. Yeah. So yeah. Well done, nobody else. <laughs> Yeah, when somebody's already demonstrated that they like to murder people, and that they will murder people, and that they will get away with it mainly because they wear badges, it's a perfect example. Um, I'm just going to say out loud, if that if Kelly Thomas was a friend of mine, I would have killed those two cops after they were acquitted, because they committed murder, and there's it's right on tape. He wasn't fighting it. There's nothing <laughs> debatable about what happened, and it's... The sad thing is that, uh, or the ironic thing, is that if more people talked about that, even thought about doing it, that creates a deterrent. I mean, most gun enthusiasts know that the vast majority of, of crimes that are stopped with a gun, gun is never fired. You say, look, I have a gun, which means I'm going to kill you if you don't leave. And the criminal goes, hmm, dying, not dying, I'm going to leave. We don't have the same deterrent when it comes to aggressors with badges because they know they're going to get away with it the vast majority of the time. If they didn't, the rate would go down very quickly, very drastically. The reason it doesn't is because so few people dare to talk about creating justice. And that is so scary, taking the law into your own hands. There's another way to say taking the law into your own hands. It's called being a responsible human being. If you let the rulers decide what the rulers are allowed to do, you're a slave. And if the people ever wake up and realize, wow, the murderers, when they have badges, are going to keep doing it until we stop them, then, and only then, the murderers with badges will stop doing it because it will cost them too much to do it. And, and I'm also going to frame this as a question, and maybe we can, you know, talk about it a little bit. But one of the things I struggle with is, you know, there, there's sort of the universal, and there's sort of this philosophical level of things, and it's like we have these ideas, and we need to explore these ideas, and we need to understand these things. A challenge that is a real one to me, and I think Josie kind of threw down with me when we were having our uh, Facebook bitch fight, was, um, <laughs> I did tell her I was wearing the, my apron so I could wipe the floor with her, just so everyone knows. <laughs> and um, is, there's also sort of the, the practical level. I think her response to me was like, oh, okay, you know, you don't want to get killed. So, hey, you're a chicken, is pretty much what she said. And I'm like, you know, we are doing something incredibly unique with what we are doing here. And there is the practical, and there is the tactical, and there's the philosophical. But, you know, we are talking about being in a state where the police are very conscious of us. They know. So far, we're five for zero. We're winning, and that's just on the legal side. So I'm like, you know, they're, we're wrapping them over the knuckles with the least amount of force. And it's actually working because we're getting them to stand down on issues like saying you're not allowed to film cops, right? We now know you can because of Glick. We know now you can, apparently the Constitution applies after dark and you can do it at a traffic stop. And Rock the Constitution. I put that in air quotes. Um, it's, it's important to realize that as you come, it's fun to like sit there and to be like, yeah, like I would love to like shit talk. I'd like to be as brave as the man next to me, right? But I'm like, okay, we're trying to bring people here. We're actually trying to change our own backyard, not, not the world, just here. And when we collectivize police, I think that's a mistake. There are good cops in this state who will, I know, 
There are. There are people who are one horse town, one cop towns, where the guy's been around forever. He'll shred your, you know, if you have your concealed carries, he shreds them. He will come pick you up and get you your chickens at the post office. There are still good cops. They're few and far between. They're in smaller towns. Um, the big city cops, yes, you know, there are issues. But the point is, if you're here and you're a free stater and you're around, they will know who you are. And if they know who you are, and we probably will have to censor this, but, okay, I have this theory. Give me two seconds. Okay, sorry. I have this theory, right, that the term gang, right, was something that the government bastardized, created fear around, but gangs or tribes or whatever you want to call them, they are just a gang, right? And I'm probably going to go to jail for this. But in some ways, all we're doing is building, an, I like to call it a community, but you know what? You could argue it's a gang. There are 2,138 cops in New Hampshire. So if we could fucking trigger the move, we only have 1,600 people, then it changes the dialogue because they get to understand, you know what? There are people here who think that that kind of behavior and to beat a homeless man to death or to beat the guy from Strange Brew to a pulp with 26 broken bones in his face and nothing happened or the cops who arrested me, tied me to a pole, took me out behind a fucking building, threatened me physically, those cops are gone. They are gone. Now they, one was fired, three retired, but you know what? They're not working in New Hampshire. They have to go to Mass, right? Because we don't want them here. So if we can think about these problems on a localized level and take it down from the ideas of, yes, these are discussions we need to have and be like, okay, but what is the reality on the street and how are we going to deal with this? That's where we should play and that's why you should move and then we can come together and we can keep ourselves safe and keep our friends safe. Uh, I'll try to keep this... Never mind, I won't. <laughs> I, there's two things I want to say. The first is I appreciate the question because it's a question about an actual situation. And that is where the rubber meets the road, and those are um, questions worth asking. You know, what do you, what do, you do when this, then this, then this? And we had a, you know, justice that wasn't justice. It's not justice. Court system's really not a justice system. I just did two rounds of jury duty. It's not a justice system. So, um, talking about real world situations, I think, is, is I, I would say, preferable to the philosophical discussion, not because the philosophical is not important, actually it's very, very important, but because at some point it becomes reality and then we can address, well, here's a specific situation, what do you think about that? I'm not actually going to answer the question. Um, I want to <laughs> pose, <laughs> I want to pose another question uh, back to all of you, really, and maybe you, Lark, and then you, Josie. Um, so the, uh, the idea is, you know, uh, we might go out and you said I might kill the cops that shot this if he was your friend, right? Um, so you're, you, you then are taking justice into your own hands. And I, and I don't necessarily object to that, certainly on the spot. We have to do that from time to time. Um, but uh, police in theory, uh, bear with me for a minute here. <laughs> I, I hear the laughs already. And by the way, so I, he I heard the comments. There, uh, there are a few good cops. No, no, there's not a few good cops. Okay. Right, so um, I'm, I'm hearing that. I'm, it's not that I'm not hearing that, but let's, let's think about this just for a minute. There are, no, there are no good cops. Okay, so if our job then is to uh, supply justice, uh, what is it that makes us think that we will not become the bad cops? And after the philosophical answer, because, because I understand that, so their philosophy, the, what makes them not good cops is, is the philosophy problem, but there is a rubber meets the road issue, and where the rubber meets the road is, none of us are perfect, and so we may indeed commit, uh, you know, an abortion of justice. We could be part of that problem as well. They are, we see it, right, the videos show it, so, so that's not controversial, we know that, but um, to, to say there are no good cops, and we would, we would therefore not be bad cops, maybe. I don't know if that's 
the, the, uh, the flip side of that coin. Maybe it is, or maybe it isn't. But at, how do you rectify the situation if there are no good cops, if there are no good people, holy good people? The literate cop? Uh, Roger Root said just, so. Oh, uh, no, we go. Seven seconds. Oh. Response. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there are no good people who imagine themselves to have rights that others do not. So I have a two part question, but I need a quick yes or no answer to the first part before I ask the second part. Uh, yes or no. Is it morally justified to kill someone who 14 years ago received stolen property and assisted in a kidnapping? Yes or no? Assisted how? Just yes or no. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll ask you the second part. Carly, yes or no? I'm not playing the game. Fair enough. For the sake of example, I'll say no. Josie? Oh, I, I don't get the assisted in a kidnapping, and I like. <laughs> you, you understand what assisted in a kidnapping means? I, I know, mean. but I, I, I understand what that means. I, it, yeah, I need you to connect the dots there. Well, he's making okay. a moral argument of eye for an eye, so death oh, for a death. Fourteen, for years, ago, Fourteen years ago, I was a corrections officer. Okay. I hated every day of the job, but if. Either one of you think that it's morally justified to kill someone who 14 years ago received stolen property, i.e. a paycheck, right. and assisted in a kidnapping, i.e. being a corrections officer, would either one of you be okay with executing me right now? Okay. Let me go get my gun. Well, that's why I asked for the details. First of all... It's obvious you're not a threat right now. I've actually just had a debate about the receiving stolen property, which I don't believe justifies it, or we're going to have to kill most of the country. Because one way or another, almost everybody receives stolen property. Um, but the reason I asked for details on the assistance, um, you might not even want to say the details. In fact, I'm not even going to ask for them. I believe there were probably times when you were doing something when at the time people had the right to kill you. Now I wouldn't do it. Because you've seen the error of your ways. I already said no. He already said no. No, I'll talk for a second. No, I, I definitely agree. Um, I agree with Larkin on that. It's important to hear the details because, um, and like I like I stated before, and like I still state, um, uh, my best friend growing up, uh, he was a corrections officer, and we fell out of touch. Um, and we got back in touch after he had seen a video, um, and he since is no longer a corrections officer. But he actually admitted Ooh. the same thing. Yeah, he said that he, um, there were times when he believed that people, that would, like what you just said, people should have fought him back and he didn't know why. Now, I don't, I don't advocate, I wouldn't advocate murdering anyone who had received stolen property, no. Not, never. My answer to that. There's no good cop, but an ex-cop. I was a cop, state cop for three years, and I quit for a better job. However, as far as the cowardice goes, I go to Columbus, Georgia, during the, the demonstration at the end of November called the So Watch, Sepulchre America's Watch, and unlike many of the people there who just parade around with signs of people's names have been killed by South American inquisitors, I get arrested. And I get arrested by the same cop every year, and I do it by arrangement. <laughs> he used to be Sergeant Joyner, now he's Lieutenant Joyner. And I talked to him on Saturday, I said, when do you want to do this? And what I do is I challenge the fences on the sides. They build these temporary fences on the side of the demonstration area. Normally the gate that we're confronting is an open gate, but for us it's closed, not barbed wired, but wired. Well, that's a federal fence if you go over that fence. But on the side fence, I get arrested by county and town cops from Columbus. And I do it to bugger their system. I load them down with thirty to a thousand to a hundred thousand dollars worth of legal costs. <laughs> And I make them pay attention to me instead of other people. So I can afford it. I live on an annuity. I don't have a job to worry about. 
I don't have family to worry about, although I did get divorced from the woman I was married to who didn't like me being arrested. <laughs> anyway, so usually I last about two bailouts be with my money before a, a woman drops me. <laughs> That's all right, I'm difficult. I'm, I'm impossible to live with because I live by my standards. Anyway. I don't think I remember what I was going to say. Thank you for sharing. Well, I have some mixed feelings on, on this, but I guess one question I do have, and if I'm misparaphrasing, let me know, but on the one comment that was made about if it is a form of bigotry if you consider, if you're saying members of the, all agents of the state are the enemy. Well, while I don't, while I don't necessarily hate them, agents of the state are participating in a monopoly on the initiation force, otherwise known as government, and they are paid through extortion. So I would say on that level, they are my enemy. So uh, uh, am I not welcome at Port Fest? With some fear and trepidation, I'll answer that question. Um, first of all, I would say, yeah, you're welcome at Pork Fest. Um, let's consider whether or not that's really bigotry. Um, and let's consider it in this way. Is your um, objection or your, let's, uh, you say enemy. So, so when you call somebody an enemy, I. That's, that's got to be pretty close to hatred. I don't know. Maybe we, we might be wandering into uncharted territory here. And, and, I, and I'm on the other side of this, by the way. Um, I live in Keene, for those of you who don't know. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of what's going on there, but, but you know, I'm, the, I'm being a Free State Project participant, I'm the target of bigotry that doesn't look altogether different. Um, and, the, and the question that I would ask is, is it is it conceivable that your objection is to um, the things the things that are essential to them being part of the state, let's say, whatever activity it is that they choose to do, um, do you object to those things? Or is it that they, as a person, are your enemy simply because, for no other reason, you, you don't know them, you don't care to know them, and you simply just hate them? Uh, the latter case, I would say, is a lot looks a lot more like bigotry to me, um, and so I hear that you know there are no good cops. Okay, maybe if the if your argument is there are no good cops or there are no good state employees, there are no good politicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Having that argument on the basis of what it means to be, for example, what it means to be a police officer, what it means to be a politician, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I think that's a reasonable discussion to have. I don't object to having that discussion. To simply make a blanket statement like, all, all of these people, you're my enemy, I hate you on the basis of, blah, blah, blah. Every time I um, hear an argument like that, I at least can imagine, if not find in, in real life, somebody who really should not be the enemy, who really should not be hated, who's being discriminated against on the basis of something or another, maybe it's something that they, they chose, or maybe it's something that they are. Um, and. And I don't. I certainly don't think that promoting that idea is a good idea. So promoting that kind of bigotry, you you are a blank. Therefore, without further consideration of who you are as a person. Um, so that's the question I would ask, I guess, in return. I, I can. Well, I just want to address one thing. I know we're going back and forth with the. There's no good cops. There are good cops. There's no good cops. There are good cops. Now a lot of people are gonna like kind of not believe that they're going to hear me saying this, but there are good cops. What happens, a good cop is a good cop that stops a bad cop when they're killing someone. Unfortunately, <laughs> nine times out of ten, those cops are fired. In the example of a woman, oh I forget her name, um, she stopped a bunch of her fellow officers from killing an innocent person, and she was immediately fired. In other cases where officers, you know, stand up and, and speak out against injustices committed, perpetrated by their, by their peers and fellow officers, they are usually just uh, bullied, ostracized, threatened, 
um, into resigning on their own. So, like I said, like I've said before, instead of you know police departments themselves um, weeding out the good cops like it used to be many, many years ago. I think we've read stories. I personally don't remember it. They're now weeding out the bad ones. So yes, we are left with mostly bad cops. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen many videos of cops saving lives. But when I start seeing more of those than the cops taking lives, then I'll talk about good cops. Uh, when, people, when people say like, um, well, there are, there are good cops. There are cops who mean well, and there are cops who do good things. Every cop I know initiates violence against innocent people. Um, and when people say, well, you shouldn't bunch a whole group together, I say, how about carjackers? Are there good carjackers? They help the little ladies across the street when they're not robbing other people at gunpoint. The description of what they are is aggressors for the state. You can't be a consistently good person um, and be an aggressor for anybody. I would quickly say, I try not to hate anybody. Um, try, being the operative word there. Um, and I don't judge my enemies whether, whether on, on whether I like them or not, I judge them on whether they are a threat to me or not. Um, and almost everybody with a badge is a threat to me. Um, I also don't think the equation of when force is justified has anything to do with their motives or intentions or beliefs or mental ability. If somebody is mentally imbalanced and coming at me with an axe and my choices are kill him or be killed, I'm still going to kill him. And it'll suck, um, but if a cop means well, I mean, most of the Nazis meant well, they still should have been shot to stop them. Okay, so it's um, 9.20 and this was supposed to be an hour, so are you good with taking like maybe two more questions? Two more right. questions, no, then we're going to wrap nice. up. Yeah, <laughs> They're sitting up there doing the answers. So we'll leave the I mean, if someone will get me a drink. I will. <laughs> you want to get Carol, you want a KBR? I had a drink. This real, real fun, real fast. <laughs> Um, basically, my my question is is that uh, um, um, uh, since we're, since we're on the on the discussion of the NAP and, and the and aggression and so like that, uh, what what if you see aggression happening, regardless if it's like you know, um, regardless if it's like another person or a, or a cop or something like that, if someone's aggressing against another person. Do you think that Emma, do you think that a person has a moral obligation to actually Emma, to actually help out their fellow man and actually like you know mom get get in there and actually uh, mom and actually help out that individual? I'll take that with somebody who's still Here, I drink for power. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the law and even the common law will say that. Um, you do not have a moral obligation to do it. Um, or you do not have a legal, let's define it, let's distinguish there. You do not have a legal obligation to help anyone. Thank you. Now I'm confused. <laughs> um, but I think you might have a moral obligation, and I think it's one of those situations where everyone will know for themselves. I mean, I think one of the interesting things that has come up tonight is both the idea of how do we as individuals, which is what we are, I mean, I actually believe we're each a god of our own universe, and if we're all gods, we're all equal, and therefore we should all be able to get along because I gotta respect you if you're a god, and you gotta respect me back, right? Hallelujah. And Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Can I get a an name? Amen. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we as individuals, which is, I think, part of why, you know, there, there's a little pushback on all cops are bad or whatever. For me, that part of why I say I don't believe that is because I, I prize individualism over statism. So I actually prize the idea of not collectivizing over the idea of saying we have to fight this evil. Like I think, you know, if we're all gods of our universe, we can figure out what our evils are and how we're gonna fight them. And I know on a personal level, I, you know, something I, 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 I'm deeply still shamed about 
when I was a new immigrant and I was living in the Tenderloin in San Francisco and it was a very dangerous neighborhood. Um, you know, there was a dead heroin addict in our thing. There was a crack house in the basement. It was pretty sketchy. And I was walking to the library, which is where there was internet, and there was a pimp beating up a prostitute on the sidewalk, probably at 5.30 in the afternoon. And I remember the feeling I had where I was like, you need to do something. And I was like, there's nothing I can do. What am I going to do? I'm like two weeks fresh off the boat. I'm not armed. I don't know how it works here. And I put my head down and I just kept walking. And the guy fucking beat the shit out of her. And I am ashamed about that. So I know from my moral compass, there's a reason I carry. There's a reason I've learned to shoot. And these things weren't things that were easy for me. I'm, you know, I'm a happy-go-lucky, artsy drunk. I'm not, you know, <laughs> I don't want to know how to snipe. I'm glad I do, but I don't want to really. And I think those things all circle back to a sense of personal responsibility and saying, and I really do mean it when I say, you know, if we all accept we're gods of our own universe and every universe has to somehow figure out the frequency that we're going to all go along with, then find your moral compass, know what it is, you learn through experience and, um, you know, know when to shoot and know when not to shoot and equally know when to shoot your mouth off and know when not to do it. <laughs> Uh, I know the term uh, moral obligation is used in a couple different ways. Um, in the in the kind of general should you do something sense, I'd say yeah you should. Uh, nobody has the right to force you to, and people have to to choose self preservation when it's not going to do any good, and it can always be a horrible choice. Um, the only other thing I'd add is that if every single person accepted that it was up to him to make justice happen, the world would be a hell of a lot better than it is now. This really will be quick. Um, when we use the term self-defense, I personally uh, um, almost always om omit the self part because I think really there is a right to defend other people, um, provided you understand that it's actually aggression and not a Hollywood movie scene or something like that. Uh, so, so when we say self-defense, I, I don't think we mean you can only defend yourself. You can't defend somebody else. I think it is legitimate to do that. Yep. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I, I would say so. I've, I've been on the other end of it. I've never been in the situation. I mean, aside from stepping in, actually I've been on both sides of it. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I was, I was thinking about what, you know, there was a, I had actually been beaten, uh, by about six men. They were not wearing badges. Um, but no one stepped in to help me. And it was in the middle of a very busy intersection in Philadelphia. And it was really scary. Um, and, uh, I was amazed. And, uh, you know, later, uh, I got to listen to the 911 calls. Um, but uh, I know that looking back, I thought, man, if two or three of those cars had just stopped and maybe, maybe just stopped their cars, not even got out, just kind of paused to see what was going on, I feel like maybe I wouldn't have gotten beaten so bad. Um, now, and I've also been on the other end of that where I saw um, a couple men with badges bullying a young man who was maybe 100 pounds. Um, and I didn't step in and start taking punches. But I definitely stepped in, made a lot of noise, and brought attention to it, brought, got my camera out, and it stopped the young man from having money extorted from him. Um, they turned their focus on us, and everyone actually got away. That doesn't always happen that well. Um, you know, it, it can be dangerous both ways, so you have to know what you're getting into. Um, but I would say, you know, just like um, using defensive force, there are levels of bringing attention to it. You know, the more, if you can get 100 people to just turn around and look at something shitty happening, chances are the people are not going to like having that big of an audience and they're going to stop what they're doing. So that's my answer. Before I get to my question, there are two topics that I've heard tonight that kind of bother me. One is the general assault against police officers or members of the government. Um, there's a set policy called the right of revolution, which requires petitioning the courts of law for redress, then the executive and legislative and waiting 40 days before you start attacking them. So generally attacking all police officers is allowed after that process, but saying now that it's acceptable, I think it's kind of a little bit much. Um, and the other issue you, you had was about the question about how do we not become them? 
uh, the simple answer is if they're acting with contradiction of their principles, they are, and you are not, they are less than you, and you have a right to stop them. And no one has a right to stop you because it's a contradiction of principles to stop you. So it's not about good or bad, it's about valid or invalid. And the laws are still arbitrary. I don't know. I, okay, you lost me on the eugenics part there. Eugenics. Say it again. No, 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 no. No. So if there's a contradiction, Sorry, like the, the police and the police and. What are you drinking? What are you drinking? I'll have a two thousand. That wasn't the last question. The, 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 the police in New Hampshire enforcing drug laws. There's a contradiction in their own laws to enforce it. It's illegal for them to do it, but they do it anyway. Stopping them from doing that is stopping someone who's using force with contradiction. There's no contradiction in stopping someone who's using force with, with contradiction. So the element is, there is no good or bad there. It's not us becoming them. They are not us because they are acting with contradiction. We are not acting with contradiction. That's the, the, the way you identify how to stop it. But my two quick questions are, one, the charter for the Free State Project, is there some way to get access to it online? And the other question is, since um, there are members of the government that are acting with contradiction, um, do you intend on banning them from places like Chris, Chris Crankwell from this type of event and people that associate with them, like Mark, uh, Mark Warden, who I greatly respect? I mean, are you going to be ethically consistent in who you ban over associating with promotion of violence? I'm confused. Whoa. Yeah. I, I might be the right person to answer those questions. Um, let's see, this, the second question about banning people who uh, promote violence. I think, I would like to think, by the way, first of all, we're all humans too, but uh, that caveat aside, I would like to think that we would be consistent. Um, the fact that we haven't banned politicians, by the way, here's a disclaimer that you all need to know for those of you who say there are no good politicians. You're, you're now going to really not like me. I signed up to run for state rep. Now, um, so tomorrow when I propose something that's uh, completely antithetical to, to government, then you'll see that I'm essentially a walking contradiction. But anyways, um, so the uh, obviously we haven't banned all the politicians. There's a whole bunch of them around here. Um, uh, and a lot the, of them are, are anarchists. Uh, are some of them are uh, anarchists or, or voluntarists or, mm -hmm. um, or otherwise uh, non-aggression principle adherents and advocates. And I think that's a good thing, bringing that voice to the uh, existing government. I don't think it's harmful anyways. Um, it may not be the solution of the problem or the, the total solution of the problem, but certainly advocating even in institutions that are fundamentally, you know, advocating to the slave owner to treat the slaves better is not necessarily a bad thing, I don't think. Um, it may make the life uh, for those, those slaves better, and I think that is a good thing. So, um, no, we don't ban them unless they really promote violence. And so I, I think that, you know, the question is if somebody brings to our attention Here's these people promoting violence in these specific ways. And so we don't... Stop fucking your whining, man! And we can yeah. all just get along! What, yeah, so one thing, <laughs> one thing that I would like to point out is we hear very little specific complaints. And when I say specific complaints, here's a person who did these things or said these things. Um, <laughs> we don't hear a whole lot of that. So if you think somebody's promoting racism or bigotry or violence, um, then... You know, board at freestateproject.org works, it gets to us, and, and we hear very little of that. So just to be honest with you, um, I would like to think that we would be consistent. The first question, uh, give me a three-word reminder. Uh, the, the, the charter for the research. Oh, yes, uh, the, the Free State Project's organizational documents. So that's the, the question is, what uh, what is our formation and all of that? Now, the current website, I believe, does not have the bylaws on it. I might have put them up. I they don't may, remember. They may really, or may not the be The paperwork, up. not a high priority. The paperwork is not Carla's forte. No, I if hate that shit. If you dig through the internet archives, it is there. It's on the old Free State Project website, which is still actually accessible. It is old.freestateproject.org. Old. Old. Yeah, that's the address. Old.freestateproject.org. The bylaws are on there. Uh, they haven't gotten migrated to the new website yet, and I, I hope that they do soon. Um, Anyone want to volunteer? The actual <laughs> articles of incorporation themselves are not there. I believe they're a matter of public record. I don't actually know how you would go about getting those. Um, if you ask one of us, probably not Carla, because she doesn't like paperwork, um, we can try to get that to you. I, the document that's actually, I think, more important and more instructive is the bylaws. 
Um, and the bylaws spell out things like what uh, the procedures are for board member replacement, uh, what the roles of the president are, and it also includes things like the statement of intent and participation guidelines, uh, which which are what when you sign up for the Free State Project, what you're signing up for. That is, you know, I state my solemn intent to blah 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 those, those kinds of things. Um, so the SOI, the participation guidelines, are both on the Free State Project website. The bylaws may or may not, but but the, I believe, current version is on the old website, which is still accessible. Articles of incorporation are not. I, I think that's the answer to your question. Yeah. Could I rephrase it for you? Sure. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. with the question about supporting that, if, if I understand it correctly, if you become a, fruit, a, a state representative, you'll be responsible for voting on a county budget. Is that correct? Not a county budget, but it would be on the state budget, yeah. No, I, I was under the impression the state reps also voted on. Oh. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I guess it'd be a terrible yes, state yes, yes. Yes. Okay. So, so yes. Okay. So would you then vote for any budget that would support uh, courts that prosecuted people for drugs? I would probably not vote for a budget that was bigger than zero, but. Okay. So. But, but the question. <laughs> I'm getting at already. That's the plan. Don't hold me to that. Don't hold me to that because if you guys want to donate money to the state, then we could develop a budget to spend that. I mean, I'm not kidding. But would you consider, if you did vote for a budget that supported those who <coughs> continue to prosecute people, you wouldn't consider that promoting uh, a contradiction or violence by promoting the drug war? Um, I, I don't think I... Let me let me not answer that question. <laughs> oh, that's a politician answering me. Is that promoting violence? Um, well... It, that's that's the question. No, that, it's a good question. It's not a bad question. It's an on-the-spot question. I don't mind on-the-spot questions. Um, is that promoting violence? I would have to. I, you know what? I want to. I would have to put some thought into that. Maybe it is. Certainly, the activities in the court are now. Is voting is voting for a budget at all promoting violence? I mean, you could. You probably could make that case, right? A budget that's bigger than zero, right? Now, I'd vote for a budget that was zero, but. Unless the government was funded entirely voluntarily, really, is Why voting for a budget a bigger than zero promoting violence. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to give that some thought, but that might that might be a plausible. Well, Nick, 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 no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Last thing I want to say is a dig in the form of a suggestion of the next topic of an alt expo discussion, which is, in order to be consistent, should the Free State Project, because it opposes the advocacy of violence ban any minarchists from speaking at the park fest. <laughs> that, that is a good question. I, th I think the point I you reveal... It there, damn it. You you reveal it there. Here's what you reveal, and this is, this is fair actually, what you reveal is a conflict between the statement of intent and that line, you know, doesn't welcome people to promote violence, right? So is a minarchist promoting violence? Well, if the, if the government has as its maximum role <laughs> protecting individuals' rights to life, liberty, and property, and a person argues that there should be a government that gets as big as that, is that government being violent? Well, that's that's your question. I, I don't think we're going to answer it tonight, yeah. Yeah. It's a very long but topic. that's a neat question. <laughs> I like the question. That would actually be, you know, that's a basic debate between monarchists and anarchists, right? Um, I actually wanted to give a shout out to some of Coplock, which did a interesting move, right? One of the um, things that, you know, we struggle with, like, it's not, you know, when all this drama went down, I was like, wow, you know, people are... Um, so upset and people confuse authority with the state you know and private with public and we could debate that till the cows go home but i really liked you know with with, with board decisions it's something i struggle with i am you know an uh, an anarchist and I struggle with these things, right? How do you have sort of authority and you kind of get these things done because you kind of have to have them done in a way that, that is consistent and fair. And what I really liked, you know, so how we do it when you're on a board somewhere is you have really boring late night, Sunday night, because it's usually the only time we can get together, Skype meetings once every two months. 
And, you know, you might have to make a decision like we had to do with um, he who shall not be named. And um, I could have called him Cuntwell. Oh, I didn't. Oh, <laughs> you just did. You just did. Um, never do well. That's what I like to call him. Anyway, um, so that was a tough decision. It's not like, you know, we sit around in a room and we're like, ha, 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 we just fucked up someone's life, right? We actually <laughs> took this <laughs> seriously, awesome. and it was a difficult decision, and it's hard to do these things, right? You want to be a good steward of something that you've put time and energy and effort in and that you love and that you want to see prosper and grow and want to be surrounded with the people you want to be with. So when we have a board meeting, we do the board meeting, and then we write up the minutes and we take a vote and we say this, right? So something like the Free State Project is a statist organization because it is licensed by the state. It, you know, jumped through the hoops. Those things are true. That exists. That doesn't mean that we as individuals can't decide things and make up our own minds. So the shout out to Cough Block was, you know, uh, several people came out and they wrote a little message and, you know, they had certain issues as well and they undersigned their names. And I loved that because that was a voluntary solution to something that as an organization, we are not that far evolved. We're 12 years old, we've been around, you know, we're still under the strictures and under the handcuffs of the state, right? But the point is to trigger the move so that we can move away from that and then we as individuals can say, hey, this is my pet pony and I'm gonna run with this and I wanna do this and I'm gonna go in this direction and I'm gonna run for office and I'm pretty sure I'm never gonna run for office unless you actually want someone who's done coke off a hooker's ass. <laughs> <laughs> That was really scripted. Wow. Wow. Teresa. Teresa. <laughs> Thank you so much for filming this whole thing. That was the last question. <laughs> what a way to end it. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Oh, is there one more question? Yeah. Okay. Oh, come on. We can't end with Coco for Hooker's ass. <laughs> What happened down there in Nevada on the Bundy Ranch and how the townspeople came together armed, not wanting to back down or not going to back down, you know, against the feds there. Ooh. I was wondering what you thought about that. And then you have that Sheriff Gillespie who sided with the feds instead of trying to protect the people of his county. I was just wondering, you know, they came in with the guns and... And there were people willing to shoot cops. Well, it didn't. It could have turned out pretty bad. I can go, but I've done a ton. Anybody else? Yeah. I think that I'm glad they went down there and said they wouldn't back down. That's the extent. I'm, that's about the sheriff who stood uh, against the people. I think that's horrific. And he obviously kind of showed his true colors. That's... That, yeah, I, that's it. I agree with it. I didn't beat Coco from I'm done. As an individual incident, I don't care all that much about it, but it is gigantically significant when a number of people stand up and say, no, we're not going to do what you say, and the thugs go, um, we're going to kind of back off for a while. It isn't over. They're going to try to do something else and weasel some way in. Um, but I think it's hugely significant any times the slaves stand up and say, we're done picking cotton, and the master says, uh, 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 well, eventually we're going to maybe do something about this. This, even though on an individual basis, kind of who cares, it's one incident out of a zillion, that concept, that idea is the death knell of statism when the people just say we're not playing anymore, we're not going to cooperate. And notice they did it without having to shoot anybody. Just the ability to resist made the, the fascists back off so far. Fuck we'll yeah. It's tangential. May or may not be germane. <laughs> uh -oh. I don't, I don't, I don't, it's, it's, it's a question. I don't want to keep anybody though. But, it, but why don't we take it offline? Because I did promise two more. Can, I promised yeah, two no, questions, fine. and I need to stick with yeah. that. So I want to thank you all for coming out tonight, participating. I think Nick's gonna wrap up, and you all have a good night.
Okay, good. I'm glad we could talk about really light issues tonight. I'm glad we had a good time doing that. Um, so even though um, uh, Alt Expo is now taking Coke money and we're part of the FSP, um, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, we still require... I know, I want some of it too, it still has to come. Anyway, so we still, we still, we still need donations. We, uh, this is the first year that Alt Expo has ever had um, speakers come out actually like from other states. We actually were able to get them and get them here, which is amazing. So uh, I'm passing around a plastic bag. It's not very pretty, but it gets the job done. If you just want to donate a few bucks, it'd really help us out. We have a lot of costs. This shit isn't free, so, you know. Uh, I'm not very eloquent with words, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, so but but more importantly, uh, thank you to everybody who came. Uh, this is really awesome. I'm glad so many people came. Um, check out the Alt Expo schedule. And you should check out the Alt Expo schedule. And Where? You should, uh, which is online. It's on port. The it's in the Pork Fest. Um, yeah, Shaolin Rifle Works tent. The one farthest closest to Reg is the Alt Expo tent. Right, the one farthest closest. Right. So. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I just. It's the like zombie apocalypse tent. Oh. Uh, okay. Oh, the, yeah, that one. Sure. sure. So anyway, it's also in the pork pork fest schedule, so it's not like all text was hard to find this year for once. But it's under Shaolin. Um, but it's under Shaolin ten. So. And we have programming after seven also. Yeah, which yeah. we're gonna get around to scheduling. We we always do things last minute, so yeah. don't worry about it. <laughs> um, we're we're pros. We're pros. Okay, so that's that's it. I'm done. I'm gonna stop blathering. I'm gonna pass this around. Thank you. I'm gonna be a good girlfriend to help you up.